Now that we have a good understanding of the effect of nuclear charge and the shielding effect, that's going to help us with section 3, which are the periodic trends. There are four periodic trends that we're going to discuss. Atomic radius, ionic radius, ionization energy, and electron affinity. By the end of this video, or two videos if it takes, you will be able to look at the periodic table and be able to identify certain things like which element is the largest, which element will more, which element will more readily give up electrons, and so on and so forth. Before we get started, it is important to note that these are trends. There's always going to be exceptions for various reasons, but the trends of the periodic table can help us decide how to answer those questions. So let's start out with an easy one, atomic radius. In other words, we're simply looking at the size of the atom. A little bit about how we measure the size of atoms. Remember in topic three, the atom is not this very clear cut particle where you have a nucleus at the center and then a very clear cut boundary around. That doesn't exist. And so measuring the size of an atom is pretty difficult when you only have one. So what scientists have done is they've actually looked at two of the same atom paired together in a bond. They take the distance between the two nuclei and cut that in half to get what we call the atomic radius. So that's actually how they find the size of the atom. Now how do you know what this trend is by looking at the periodic table? We'll take a look at the abridged periodic table that we have on the screen here. As you go from left to right or across a period, what do you see happening to the size of the atom? You notice the size of the atom is getting smaller. Why is that? Well, let's talk about it because I want to make sure you know why it does that versus just memorizing a trend. Let's take for instance lithium compared to neon. We saw that in a previous video. Lithium has three protons. Neon has 10 protons. They both have one thing in common, and that is they both have two energy levels because they're both in row two. I want you to think about these electrons, particularly in the outermost energy level. We already decided that which one of these has the higher effective nuclear charge. It's neon, right? Because neon has 10 protons versus lithium only has three. Because neon has a higher effective nuclear charge, it is actually able to pull in tighter its electrons than neon or than lithium will. And so because of that, elements on the right side of the periodic table tend to be smaller. Well, what happens as you go down the group? You notice that as you move down a group, the atoms get larger. Why is that? Well, let's revisit an example we saw in the last video. Right below lithium is sodium. Yes, sodium may have 11 protons, but sodium now has three energy levels. And that third energy level is what makes it larger than lithium. So the size increases down a group simply because we're adding more energy levels. If we take a look at a trend picture, this is a way to think about it. Atomic radius or size increases as we go to the left and also as we go down. Based on that, which element of the periodic table would be the largest? If we follow these arrows to the left and down, we could predict francium would be the largest element on the periodic table. What about the smallest? What element would be the smallest on the periodic table? Reverse the arrows to find out where it's decreasing, and it seems to be pointing towards helium. That's how the trend can be used. Now, a quick note about the idea that it's a trend. Remember as we went from lithium to neon, we did see that generally the size decreased. If we were to look at row three, in other words, going from sodium to argon, we see the same trend. But what about when we go to row four, where it starts with potassium and ends at krypton? Generally it decreases, oh, but we do see a little bit of spike there a little bit. There are some exceptions to the trend, but nevertheless, the trend does work for the most part. Let's go back real quick to demonstrate a point. What if I was asking you to analyze two elements and those two elements were carbon and phosphorus. And I asked you to tell me which one was larger. Well, this may be a little confusing because on the one hand, carbon is more to the left, but phosphorus is further down a group. So which one would win? Well, the answer to the question is phosphorus would be the larger. How can you tell? Because even though car carbon is further to the left, 
phosphorus has an extra energy level. And so when you have situations like that, looking at the electron configuration can help. And we will see how to do that later. All right, let's do some real quick practice with examples two and three. For example two, I'm showing a pairing of two elements in each question. State which atom would have the larger atomic radius. If we look at sodium versus potassium, potassium would have the larger because potassium is further down the group. Let's locate fluorine and uh, oxygen. Fluorine and oxygen are in the same period. Oxygen is more to the left, so oxygen would be expected to have the higher atomic size. Finally, if we look at xenon versus krypton, xenon is further down the group, and therefore it will have a larger size. And then example three. Compared to sulfur, chlorine has a blank effective nuclear charge and a blank atomic radius. So let's first find sulfur and chlorine on our periodic tables. They're right next to each other. Based on that, chlorine has a higher effective nuclear charge because it's further to the right. And based on that, it would end up having a smaller radius because that higher effective nuclear charge would pull the electrons in tighter. Since we've been talking about the size of atoms, it's a good opportunity for us to talk about the size of ions as well. Recall that atoms sometimes will gain or lose electrons to become like noble gases, and when that happens, they create ions. Specifically, when an atom loses electrons, meaning it becomes a cation or a positive ion, the radius will decrease because of the reduction in electron repulsions and shielding. What do I mean by that? Well, Let's take a look at the electron configuration for regular sodium. Regular sodium's electron configuration is here. When it becomes an ion, it loses that one electron that's out there in the third energy level. As a result, now the sodium ion actually doesn't have anything in its outer energy level. It now only has two energy levels. Not to mention, it now has one, X, one less electron. Sodium originally had 11 protons, but when it loses an electron, it now has 10. And not protons, excuse me. Electrons. So 11 electrons there, and 10 electrons there. If now it has one less electron, the repulsion decreases. Another way to think about it is the 11 protons that are still in the middle of a proton, uh, of a sodium atom, these 11 protons are going to be able to pull these 10 electrons in tighter than it would have the 11. On the flip side, when an atom gains electrons, which means it becomes an anion or a negative ion, the radius will increase because of the increased repulsion. So in this example, we're going to see the opposite uh, phenomenon happen than did sodium. Regular chlorine looks something like this with its electron configuration given. A simpler way of looking at it is a regular chlorine atom has 17 protons with 17 electrons zooming around it in, the, in three energy levels. Now, when you come over here to the ion of chlorine, it still has 17 protons, but now that extra electron means it has 18 electrons versus 17. By adding that one electron in there, it now is creating more repulsion, which pushes the size of the ion out. Think about it like this. Remember when you were in grade school in PE class and your instructor said, okay, I want you all to find your own space and circle around because what we are going to do is you're going to do some stretches. And so you would get your arms out and make sure you have space, right? Well, think if you added one more student to that circle, what would end up have to happen? The circle would have to get larger to accommodate that one extra student. That's exactly what happens. And by the way, this is also the reason why when you have an atom and you remove an electron, such as what we did before with sodium, this is why the circle decreases. There's less repulsion. So to review, and I'll write it up here, this is good to write in your notes. When you have a neutral atom, the cation will always be smaller. And when you have a neutral atom, the anion will always be larger. This is a good way, this is a good thing to write down to remember this trend. Now, let's take a look at the ionic radius trend as we look at the periodic table. First of all, let's talk about the group trend. 
we see that ions will increase in size as you go down the group. This is the same reason they increase in size with atomic radius. We're adding more shells. There are more layers. But you'll notice it gets a little weird with the period trend. We see that cation size decreases as we move to the right. And so does anion size. Well, why, if they both decrease moving to the right, why do we feel the need to separate them? Why can't we just have one arrow that says size decreases to the right? That's because cations and anions do different things. For example, cations are going to lose electrons. And we saw losing electrons makes the ions smaller. But anions gain electrons. And, be, and we saw that when you gain electrons, it, get lar it gets larger. So we cannot compare cations to anions. That's like comparing apples to oranges. So you can only use this trend when you're comparing cations to cations and anions to anions. For example, if I was to ask you to compare the size of the sodium atom compared to the size of the magnesium atom, both of them are positive. So I can use this trend. I can say, all right, between these two, which one is the larger one? Sodium would be the larger ion out of these two because sodium is further to the left. It would be right here, whereas magnesium is right here. Similarly, if I were to ask you to compare the sulfide ion compared to the chloride ion, they're both anions. And so therefore, I can use this trend. I, could, I would see that the smaller ion would be more to the right. So if I compare these two, sulfur is larger because chlorine is more to the right. Chlorine is about here, sulfur is here. But I could not use this trend if I wanted to compare the size of the sodium ion compared to the size of the sulfide ion. To do that, I would have to look at the electron configurations and see how all the electrons are dispersed. This right here is just a visual representation of what I stated before. The ions, the, the elements that are in red represent atoms that would become cations. Notice, for example, the lithium positive ion compared to its neutral counterpart. Notice the, the cation is always smaller in size compared to the neutral. Same thing for sodium ion versus neutral sodium. The sodium ion is smaller compared to its neutral counterpart. But over here in blue, these represent atoms that become anions. Neutral oxygen is smaller than the oxygen ion or oxide ion. The anion is always larger than its neutral counterpart. So let's look at some examples. If you are comparing the sizes of different ions that are not in the same group, period, or isoelectronic to each other, then you need to look at their configurations. In other words, if all the trends we've been talking about up to this point do, don't work, then you need to look at the electron configurations. Here's what I would do. If I was looking at this set of four ions, and asked to define which one is smallest and which one is largest, here's a way you could do it. The first thing I notice is that I have two cations. I'm going to use my trend to figure out which of those two are the largest. And then I'll do the exact same thing with my two anions. So let's start out with the cations first. I want you to locate copper and potassium on the periodic table. Based on where they're at and knowing that they're both positive, which one of those would be expected to be the smallest? So we're going to answer smallest first. Of those two, copper would be smaller, potassium would be larger because of the group tr or the period trend that we talked about. All right, now let's look at fluorine and chlorine. Out of those two, which one would end up being which one be, would be predicted to be smaller? Fluorine would be smaller because it's further up in the group. And chlorine would be expected to be larger. Now that I've done that step, I'm now going to take a look at my two smaller options. We've already determined that those two would be smaller relative to cations versus cations, anions versus anions. But now which one is truly the smallest? What I would do is I would look at the electron configurations. And same thing for chlorine and potassium. So let's do that. Between copper and fluorine, I can see copper has a third energy level. Fluorine only has a second, so that would be the smallest. If I take a look at the two larger, I notice that they're isoelectronic. They both have 18 electrons. 
but because potassium has 19 protons, it'll pull them in tighter. So 